get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Atari, many more, Brian Kurtz, how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Our sponsor today is Rise25.com, where six, seven, eight-figure business owners come together live and in person to solve big business challenges and lead with lifelong friendships. Check out Rise25.com. It's run by myself and co-founder John Corcoran, and it's application only. And Brian Kurtz has even been invited several times. He's yet to attend. Brian, <laughs> Kurtz, <laughs> Brian Kurtz is founder of Titans Marketing, where he hosts two mastermind groups. I can speak from personal experience. They're out of this world, and he does consulting with bleeding edge companies. He's overseen the mailing of approximately 1.3 billion pieces of direct mail over the past 30 plus years in direct response. Those campaigns have generated hundreds of millions of dollars, and he's helped lead the helm of Boardroom Inc. with Marty Edelston, and its height was a $150 million company, and he's worked with some of the world's greatest copywriters and marketers, and still does. He's co-author, which we're going to talk about today, with Craig Simpson of The Advertising Solution, Influence Prospects, Multiply Sales, and Promote Your Brand with Lessons from the Legends and that can be found on thelegendsbook.com. Brian, thanks for joining me. Thank you. You know, it sounded like all I did was direct mail, I realized on that introduction. So I just want to make sure that I do understand that there's other things besides direct mail. No, there there's, isn't. Yeah, there's an internet. I think this is oh. th- that in- and there's the and there's that the Facebook thing. I, I've heard about that. So, you know what's interesting is you hate the title of this book. I do. Um, it was interesting because um, when Craig knocked on my door and said, Brian, you want to do a book with me? I'm thinking, well, I'm thinking about doing my own book soon, when, right. when, whenever I get to it, of course. Right? right? How many people have a book in them that they never write? Right? Yeah. So um, he knocked on my door and said, you know, I want you to write this book with me. And I said, OK, what's it about? And what's the title? He goes, it's called The Advertising Solution. I said, I don't know anything about advertising that smells like general advertising, which gives me hives. Right. You know, general advertising means, you know, branding and publicity and, you know, um, image building. And I'm like, not my game. I'm a direct marketer. And so he went on and started talking a little bit more. And I realized that the title just didn't really represent the book, but it did represent the legends that are profiled in the book because they did come out of what we would consider to be traditional general advertising and what I realized as we started talking is like the six guys that Craig chose to profile yeah. it's like yeah they were considered advertising but wait a minute they were like the fathers of direct marketing they were in in some cases the fathers of copywriting yeah. the fathers of testing and the metrics that we use today in all of our marketing so so then, of course, I tried to get the title changed. You know, what did you um, want to? What would you have titled it? I, I had like sixteen or seventeen titles that I like better. What's uh, one? What's give me an example? You know, I want to hear your thought process on this. Yeah, I'm trying to think because I I kind of blocked it out after they rejected all of them because it was <laughs> with an outside publisher and they were locked into this. Right. Um, but it was you know it was stuff like um, if they wanted the word solution because Craig's first book was direct mail solution, it certainly would be you know the marketing solution. You know how, you know how how six greats of general advertising were really direct marketers. Um, that would be a you know something that would link uh, linking the past to the present and to the future is all part of my mission. I mean, I'm kind of so I'm I'm in I'm in that game for the rest right. of my life. Yeah. But the fact that there was th- this would be a book that would be part of that bridging, like. I don't want to just sit in the world of advertising. I want to be in the world of marketing and specifically direct response marketing, uh, even though a lot of these guys, you know, didn't know the term direct marketing, nor did they you know, know what was to come in the future. And yet they invented it. Yeah. So you know, I think I even had something like that. One of my titles was like, you know, um, you know, the greats who invented it, you know, right. uh, or something like that. It's just. 
I stopped fighting about the title, but then when I realized what the book was about, you know, then I said to Craig, and I wrote this in the preface of the book, that, you know, he had me, you know, in. He didn't have me at hello, but he had me at when he explained what the book was, because it's really in my sweet spot yeah. of what I want to do for the rest of my life, as I said, yeah. being the bridge between eternal truths of direct marketing and how that how it bridges to the present and then to the future. And I got to tell you, I think understanding a lot of the stuff that is in this book is very much uh, a checklist. I mean, one of the people that we got testimonials from everybody, which was fantastic, all the greats. And I remember, I think it was Perry Marshall said something like, you know, it's almost like a book you could keep on your desk. He didn't use these exact words, but I, I wanted to use these words yeah. next to the dictionary and the, and the thesaurus because you could use it as a checklist for as you're writing copy or yeah. a sales letter or things you need to do in every test, every headline. You know, it almost works as a checklist, which is great. So that to me was, you know, one of the real things that really kind of started turning me on to the book that it could be that kind of a book like almost like a reference tool yeah and then i think also the other thing that turned me on to the book is that you know they're all all six guys are dead so i i'm, I'm right, not speaking right. ill of the dead yeah. but so robert collier is one of the guys and robert collier wrote the the letter book which is one of the most important books ever written yeah. about sales letters and between you and I, I mean, no one's listening, right? I mean, you no. have to get your audience. No one's listening. No. Okay. Um, but Only there Carla. are a lot of people listening, but the book's a snooze. I mean, the book is really hard to read. It's in like really small type. It's really thick. It's like 600 pages. And it's a great book. Wow. Our book's great because we just took like the greatest hits from Robert Collier and put them into the book. So I hate to think of our book as a digest or a shortcut, yeah. but I do believe that it's going to work that way yeah. for some people who are never going to pick up Collier. Yeah. They're never going to pick up Tested Advertising Methods by John Caples. Yeah. They probably won't pick up Ogilvy on Advertising. Now you know who some of the greats are. I haven't listed them yet, but it's John Caples. It's David Ogilvy. It's it's uh, Robert Collier. And then it's also Gene Schwartz, but you better pick up Breakthrough right Advertising and not leave it to this book to summarize that. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Uh, most important book ever written on copy, creative, and human behavior. Yeah. Uh, Claude Hopkins, so my second book that I recommend is always scientific advertising. Yeah. It's also part of our giveaways. I'll talk about that later. And then the sixth uh, great is Gary Halbert. And Gary Halbert, you know, the Gary Halbert letter, you know, you should go back and read those issues time and time again and, you know, the who invented letter. the starving crowd. I mean, the fa maybe the godfather of copywriting to some degree. Really? Or at least modern copywriting. I want to talk about – I want to do some rapid fire with, with each of them. And I know you have personal experience with, with some of these, these greats too. But I want to talk about two things. One, modern day greats. Who are the modern day greats that you reached out to? Like you mentioned Perry Marshall. Who are some of the modern day greats that you reached out to to get a testimonial or to actually look at the book? Yeah, I mean, it was a it was a who's who, and it, yeah. and it wasn't just old guys, so you know, or, or older guys. So Perry did a testimonial. Jay Abraham did a testimonial. Ken McCarthy did a testimonial. Um, Gary Bensavenga, copywriter, did a testimonial. Clayton Makepeace, copywriter, did a testimonial. Uh, then I went to like some great online marketers. What did today. they say, real quick, with those guys? What What are some insights when they wrote back to you that you remember that stick out? Like you said, Perry, this is a checklist. Is there anything that they wrote back that they got out of it because they're looking at it in a different eye? Yeah. Well, one of them I didn't mention yet was Jeff Walker, and 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 Jeff Walker, you know, kind of talked about everything that he realized that he does is direct marketing. And that they, these are sort of the founders of that. So that was really, I mean, that was telling. Um, Ryan Levesque, I mean, Ryan Levesque, who's one of the great current marketers and one of my buddies. And, you know, for a guy, you know, and he's a lot younger than me. And yet he realizes that he owes a debt of gratitude to a lot of people who came before. I mean, what he invented with his survey funnel is incredible. But he understood that, you know, David Ogilvy was talking about you know, looking at your competition and knowing, you know, surveying your customers on a regular basis. Actually, actually, the surveying was more, um, I think that was more Capels. Um, um, well, no, it was Ogilvy. Ogilvy talks a lot about surveying. So, you know, that would be, you know, something that, Lebec, I, I think, um, you know, Jay Abraham was, you know, very much about, you know, where 
all of these are just, you know, these lessons that, you know, I think you said I, I sent the copy to my son who's working as a junior copywriter. You know, he had to have this book like right away. Um, I went to Denny Hatch. Denny Hatch who's an old time marketing guy, you know, great columnist. And, and he's the guy. Talk about the beauty of swipe files. He has something called Who's Mailing What? Yeah. Which this was the ultimate swipe file. And I think the idea that, you know, he says studying the work of these six guys, you know, a lot has not changed, even though so much has changed as far as, far as the technology goes. Right. Um, but those are the I mean, the, the mix of, of old and new that we got to write testimonials. Uh, Dan Kennedy wrote us one, you know, Dan Kennedy, um, you know, and, and he didn't like the title either. He told me in private. <laughs> um, but I said to him and, and, you know, one of Dan Kennedy's uh, criticisms of the book was that we didn't have a lot of ads in the book from, you know, we mm. didn't have a lot of actual sales. We have a couple of sales letters, but not a lot of samples of their work, which then made me realize, you know what? Anybody who buys the book through me yeah. or through Amazon, but then comes back to me, they're going to get a swipe file of these six greats that is going to is going to just be an incredible research tool. So, you know, what were some not other only criticisms? did they give us testimonials, they yeah. gave us ideas. Yeah, what too. were some ideas? Because you're having some of the greatest copywriters and marketers look at it. What? So Dan Kennedy said the swipe file. So you're gonna you're gonna create something which we'll talk about, which has actual sample ads that people can. And look at guys. what were some of the other criticisms that people one of the uh, other criticisms was something that I'm, I'm, I'm probably going to remedy in my in my next book when I write my book by myself. But I think it was something like I think it was from Dan also, you know, there wasn't enough of my personal experience in the book where because I was applying so much of because, again, because I grew up in direct mail and a lot of the stuff that they talked about was direct mail. I mean, right. Gary Halbert, even you know, who was around a little bit longer than a lot of the other guys because, he's you know, he died young, but he also was a more of a contemporary. You know, he talks almost exclusively about direct mail, not as much about the Internet. And I probably, if I had time, I probably could have interjected some specific case yeah. histories. Well, this is, that's what this is for, right? I mean, you're going to interject. That? This That's what this is for. You're going to interject your personal experience. I can, and, and okay. I think that my stories will still be my stories. It's just that you know, for the purposes of getting this book out on time, you know, getting the swipes from the six legends seem way more important uh, than, you know, at, trying to add in at the last minute a bunch of personal stories. Mm -hmm. I did put in a bunch of personal stories about working with Gene Schwartz because of the six, yeah. he's the one that was a personal mentor of mine. Yeah, I worked very, very closely with him. He, worked, he, did, he wrote copy for me at Boardroom. I helped him with his list work at his, his little company called Instant Improvement. And he became a true friend and mentor and someone who, one of the true heroes of my life. I mean, yeah. and Halbert I met, didn't know him that well, um, big admirer. And I'm a big admirer of all of his disciples now. I mean, he's got more, there are more, I mean, there are some people that, it, it's sort of like the, everybody claims to be at game six of the 1986 World Series. There were only 50,000 people in the stadium. <laughs> But it seems like there were like nine million who were in the stadium, right? So there's all these people that said, "Oh, I was schooled by Gary Halbert." You know, Gary Halbert had a bunch of apprentices. He was big on that. He would bring people yeah. to live with him. I've actually gone out and met a lot of them. You know, there's a lot of them floating out there. Yeah, John Carlton being one of them, and 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 you know, um, Doberman my buddy, Dan, uh, Doberman Dan. Um, I'm gonna forget some. Caleb O'Dowd, um, Caleb O'Dowd, Sam Markowitz. Yeah, you know them all. Okay, yes, yeah, Sam. That's right. So there's a, all these Talbert students. They're really and impressive. That's a, yeah. What 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 a legacy, right? I mean, not only did he leave a legacy of those Halbert letters and all of his teaching and all of his uh, videos and all of his audio interviews, but then he left all of these um, apprentices who became superstars Passing in their own. Torch. Oh, um, Scott Haynes is another one. Scott Haynes, yeah. I mean, yeah, so there's just all these guys. And so what we did also in, in the giveaway for the book that I put together, it's the swipe file, but then we also created a, a resource page that you can access videos. I think we've got six classic videos of Halbert um, uh, presenting at Ken McCarthy's seminar and also doing something with Joe Polish. And then I've got a, a Gene Schwartz Live video that I had given away at my Titans event. That's part of the resource page. And then I've also got, we went out 
and looked for all kinds of rare videos of David Ogilvy. And we found some great ones and put them all like in one place so they'd be easy to find. So that became part of the resource page too. What's, you know, I want to hear, I want to do rapid fire, but also I want to hear your book order because you have a book order. Like someone comes to you and go, you know, Brian, I want to learn direct response. And you're like, you need to do this, this book, then this book, and then this book. What's the order that you recommend well, for people? Yeah, it depends on the person, right? So if they're like a total novice, they don't know anything about direct response marketing, even though it's a pre, it was written pre-internet, one of the great books is actually a book that I used as a textbook when I taught a semester of direct marketing, which is Bob Stone's Successful Direct Marketing Methods. I don't know if they've if they've um, updated it since the seventh edition, but it at least gives you sort of the overview of what direct marketing is. Mm -hmm. And then also, you know, Dick Benson's book, which is Secrets of Successful Direct Mail, also gives you just a, a bird's eye view. I mean, I don't want people reading about just direct mail, of course, but I do think that it's important to get a sense of what it was like to pay postage and right. what people did to create marketing messages where if you made a mistake, it would cost you a lot more than screwing up on an email. Yeah. And so that so those books I do for, for like novices. But I think the books that, you know, I really like to recommend, um, obviously Breakthrough Advertising, which while it's about creative and copy and audience, it really is the book about human behavior, what makes people buy, you know, what's, you know, all about the what what, what Gene calls the monkey brain, like what what makes people do what they do? Yeah. And, you know, chapters one to three of that book are game changing yeah. chapters for any person who's involved in any aspect of marketing. Yeah. Scientific advertising is right up there. You know, even though it was a book written in 1923, written by a guy who had no science around him, Claude Hopkins, understood, you know, getting a return on investment. He understood also that I don't care if the copy sounds good. You know, what's the kind of copy that's going to going to get people to buy? Right, right. And so that's an important book. I think, you know, again, the books that we that we profiled here, Ogilvy on advertising. And then if you want to go, you know, more modern books, I mean, again, you want to mix the library. You know, I love um, um, I, I lo actually, you know what? I love Jay Abraham's book, How to Get Everything You Can Out of All You Got. got. Here too, yeah. yeah, that's a that's you sent a, that to me. Yeah, yeah, that's an incredible book. Um you know, I mean, it's not the usual, you know, it's not the usual books, but but then the books that are profiled in the advertising solution, which are scientific advertising, breakthrough advertising, John Capel's tested advertising methods, the, then get the fourth edition, not the fifth, although it's hard to find. The, the fifth edition, the book was rewritten way too much. Um, um, Robert Collier's letter book, tough book to read. I'd probably recommend just reading our sections on right. Robert Collier exactly. and not read that whole book. Um, Ogilvy on advertising. Yeah. Classic book, very important book. And then I'd get every back issue of of the Gary Halbert letter that I could find. Yeah. And I would also get every back issue going to another copywriter, Gary Bensavenga, who's one of my heroes. He had a thing called Bensavenga Bullets. And you can find them all online and what I did recently, not, well, not that recently, I did it a while back and I have two copies on my shelf, is I went in and I printed, I'm a, I'm a hard copy guy, so I printed out every single copy of Ben Savenga Bullets and I put them in a big binder clip. So I basically have, you know, the book Gary Ben Savenga could have written but didn't write. Um, incredible stuff. I think, you know, I think the Ultimate Sales Letter by Dan Kennedy is still a really important read. Um, I think Bob Bly's, you know, he has 80 books, but... I think his basic book on, on, you know, his copywriter handbook is still a very, very important book. The more recent books I've read that I think are some of the better ones for me. I love Ryan Levesque's book, Ask. Yeah. I love Jeff Walker's book, Launch. Um, you know, I think, I think Russell Brunson's book is really good on ClickFunnels. You know, so those books then, you know, you start reading about what people are doing in marketing today. And then you've got this incredible knowledge and i yeah. give out all those books at my mastermind groups i've given yeah. out like it's funny i'm giving out oh perry's 80 20 sales and marketing book perry yeah. marshall yeah so I'm, I'm giving out perry's book and jay abraham's book at a current meeting i've given out ask and launch at previous meetings um 
you know, I give out, um, you know, I, I, I try to give out as many of these great books. If I read a great book, like I always buy like multiple copies yeah. to give to people. You know, I want to do a rapid fire a little bit. So, and I know I want to end on Eugene Schwartz because I, I, you have some really good stories, uh, personal yeah. stories with him. So what you think of and what, you know, from the book or from the person, uh, Claude, you know, Claude Hopkins, what comes to mind? What should people learn? Yeah. So, you know, when you look at his, his lifespan, I mean, the guy lived between 1866 and 1932. So what am I going to learn from a guy who died in 1932 about direct marketing? Well, the answer is a lot. <laughs> um, in fact, I have this note here because Craig gave it to me. It was in 1907, he was hired by Lord and Thomas, which was like an ad agency at the time, for $185,000 a year salary. Mm -hmm. And that's At that time, a, a professor yeah. at Harvard was making $1,000 a year. Whoa. So people understood what this guy was worth to the bottom line. What There's a great lesson right there. I mean, how we pay copywriters and people who can produce results for us in marketing, be able to pay them royalties based on performance. You know, it's penny wise and pound foolish. If you if if they were paying Hopkins one hundred eighty five thousand dollars, how much money do you think he brought to the agency right. in millions? Right. Yeah. So that's a real forward thinking thing. Scientific advertising written in 1923, um, like, break, like Breakthrough Advertising written in 1966, totally relevant, 100% relevant. In fact, one of the giveaways in the, in the bonus package that we're giving to people who buy the book from, through us is a illustrated and annotated version of scientific advertising. It's a PDF. Bob Bly, the copywriter, was behind putting it together, and it's a wonderful version of this book that's in public domain and you can get it fairly expensively on on Amazon or, or Barnes and Noble. But it's it's a it's such an important book that the idea of a great of great copywriters annotating it and illustrating it, I think, was a wonderful thing to do. And we we got the rights from Bob to give it away. And so that's one of the PDFs. We're that's cool. Away. Yeah. And then the other thing I'll say about Hopkins, um, you know, again, there was no science back then. And yet he understood metrics. He understood that you know, getting results and, and getting a return on your investment yeah. of your advertising was an important thing. And he, he said something that was awesome, which is great advertising is not brilliant writing. You know, it's natural, it's simple. And it goes back to some of the other guys we've read over the years that say, you know, ugly sells, you know, that the prettiest ad is not necessarily the one you want to go with because right. it didn't sell enough. You right. know? And I think Hopkins understood that it, from the copy standpoint as well. Yeah. Robert Collier. So Collier is probably the father of the sales letter. I mean, he really understood all the components of the sales letter. In our book, we kind of bullet point every piece of the sales letter and even suggestions in what order things should be put in mm -hmm. the sales letter. Because the thing mm -hmm. is, even if you're online with a VSL, a video sales letter, or you're online with a PowerPoint, yeah. you know, or you're online or you're online doing an email series or you're offline still doing direct mail, or you're writing a script for an infomercial, you're still writing a sales letter. Yeah. And so, um, while, and while the letter book is, you know, as I said, thick and tough to read, I think we pull out, I mean, this Craig did a great job at this, because, you know, Craig did the heavy lifting on this book, I have to admit. He went into each of the volumes and pulled out, and then what I did is when I edited it, I tried to put it in a format that was really digestible, like bullet points, right. numbered points, so that people can use it as a checklist. Yeah. Which I think, the, so Craig and I really worked in tandem on that. The other thing that Collier was famous for was what we what he called showmanship. You know, the idea he was doing tokens and 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 gimmicks in in direct mail yeah. that became look what happened with Publishers Clearinghouse and Reader's Digest in the '60s, and what happens today with you know, contests and sweepstakes and all the things that we do. He was like a, a kind of a, the first guy that really understood this idea of showmanship. And the thing that I like, because I do a lot of three dimensional mail, direct mail that, you know, to small groups of people, yeah. high, high ticket buyers, sending them three dimensional packages. Definitely underutilized. Yeah. Underutilized and he understood that. What he did really he send? Did. Like showmanship, you mean he'd put stuff in the mailer like uh 
like something physical besides yeah the... there was a lot of physical product there's a lot of examples in the book i can't think of them off the top of my head yeah. there was somewhere he also did a lot with like tokens and you know the idea of stickers i mean he was doing some of that stuff when it was really expensive to do it um i also think you know he was also one of the fathers of 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 putting urgency into everything we do he was also one of the fathers of personalization so collier was you know, one of those guys that, you know, gets forgotten because, again, his book is not as well read because it's a hard read. What are some big mistakes people make in their sales letter that you've discovered? Because you've worked with some of the top copywriters in the world. You know, one of the, the biggest time. things that most copywriters will tell you is that they, you know, people bury their lead. You know, they don't because they, they always one of the biggest one of the things I learned from a lot of the copywriters I work with is that the purpose of each sentence is to get someone to read the next sentence. Right. And so. There's no flow, you know, um, and so the mistakes I see today, especially in blog, I, this is a personal preference, but I think paragraphs are way too long, you know, and, and I, I've seen some really good emails from some really experienced marketers who have great content and you got these paragraphs that are like, you know, really long Yeah, and you're burying stuff and they don't even realize that pulling out one line as its own paragraph yeah. or effect is such a powerful thing to do. I, you know, I do it all the time in my blog and I'm not even that good at it. You know, I, I see people who are great at that. And so I think there's like a reluctance to like, I don't know why people think that, you know, they have to save space. Like, I don't know if they think it's, it's a part of a conservation effort or <laughs> it's a save the planet thing, but you know, just because you're taking up more space it doesn't have to be more words, but, I think I think shorter, punchier paragraphs. I think single sentence paragraphs yeah. are just really powerful. I mean, we have a lot more in the book, and yeah. you're better at it than I am. But yeah, no, I noticed that because you know, with with you know the Titans Direct response, anyone who goes to any of your conferences, masterminds, they can't, they should bring like an extra suitcase for all the books and things that they get. But I do notice that with some of the top packages. You know, they'll take a sentence and they'll just, it'll stand alone, it'll be bold, and it really stands out. So, you know, a lot of those winning packages have those components. Yeah, yeah, you know? using italics, using, you know, that first paragraph just has to really suck you in. If you use, you know, the sales letter, people I think don't understand that if you're using an envelope, the envelope, the outer envelope is part of the sales letter. If you're writing a great email, the right. subject line obviously is part of the sales letter. Yeah. And, you know, you don't want to you don't want to waste any of that. You know, I, I just think that. Anyway, what should we learn or, or, from John Caples? So Caples is probably the father of testing. You know, he, mm -hmm. you know, really, I, I don't know if he invented the A-B split test, but close. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that it, the uh, his classic ad is, you know, the one, you know, they laugh when I when I sat down at the piano, but when I started to play, dot, dot, dot. Um, and people have ripped off. They've knocked version. that off, yeah. Oh, oh, man. The most ripped off versioning of a headline. What has been a good version, a ripped off version of that that you've seen? Um, I saw some online marketers, you know, that, you know, uh, actually, I, I've seen some um, stuff for um, sports, you know. Um, you know, they laugh when I, when I when I when I when I picked up my seven iron, but you know when I drove the ball X amount of yards. I mean, I think I've seen it used in that context. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but again, you know, here's a guy that was born in 1900. You know, uh, died in 1990, and you know his work lives on. I'm not as much of a student of his as I am of some of the others, mm -hmm. but I I do know that you know everything is testable. This is like where, you know, he really understood in a time where. You know, you didn't have computers to to read the results. You know, I, I'm amazed at how know, they were able to test. To do. Yeah. yeah. Um, David Ogilvy, what what should we learn? So from Ogilvy, him? what I said about Ogilvy, I think in my preface was, you know, he's a uh, direct marketer trapped in a general advertiser's body. And I just watched one of the videos we have on our resource page. He was a guest on David Letterman. Um, he died in 1999, so obviously it was in the 90s at some point. Yeah, um, and it was amazing watching him because he was talking about his greatest ads, but you could tell that 
he was always someone who he didn't say the word direct marketing on David Letterman even. But as I recall, when I came into the business in 1981, there was all the big ad agencies had a direct division. So there was Ogilvy and Mather and there was Ogilvy and Mather direct. Hmm. There was BBDO and BBDO direct. And there was Wonderman and Wonderman direct. And Interesting. There was, so it was a direct response uh, division. I think Ogilvy was like the first. If not the first, he was the one that really understood that, you know, while, I mean, if you watch Mad Men, you say, okay, we did an ad, everybody loved it, and, you know, Lucky Strike cigarette sales went up, so our ads must have done a good job. I mean, <laughs> that's the way a lot of stuff was measured. And it was also measured by, you know, how much people liked it or how much the ad resonated. And I think Ogilvy liked that. But he liked people to just really be vibrating. You know, yeah. his, his, the famous Rolls Royce ad was the one he talked about on Letterman. Yeah, what, again, tell me about that. Yeah, That ad was, um, I just I just heard it, it was something like um, this. It put Rolls Royce in a whole different category of sales. It was something like this. The, the engine is so quiet. The only thing that you'll hear is the ticking of the clock. Right, right. And, and then and then there was somebody who wrote in, Ogilvy tells the story on Letterman, something like, um, and someone actually had the gall to, to, to write in and say, so when are you going to fix the clock? <laughs> um, but, you know, think about it. It just, you know, that kind of ad, that kind of copy just puts you in the seat of a Rolls Royce. Yeah. And But again, there was, you know, I, I think... He just understood, though, that it was more than just, you know, looking good and feeling good. Um, he, uh, he he showed another one on that Letterman thing. It was a uh, it was an ad for stockings. I'm trying to remember the context of it. It was just it, he just had a way with images and words that you know a forerunner of some of the greatest of all time. Obviously, yeah. and he was one of the greatest of all time. Yeah. Yeah, in the book you have uh, in chapter two the Rolls Royce effect. Um, so, what about Gary Halbert? So Halbert um, died in two thousand and seven. Yeah. So you know he was around to see the internet, um, but he's still in in most of his writing and his and his speaking. I mean, it is really more about direct mail, but it's also about copywriting. You know, he invented the whole thing about the starving crowd. And I think that I have a blog post I want to write. I'm going to try to write it this week. And and the subject line is going to be when 41% is a majority. And I think people think I'm talking about the presidential election. But what I'm really talking about is the 40-40-20 rule in direct marketing, which says, you know, the success of a campaign is 40% less, 40% off, or 20% creative. Hmm. And... I want to make the case that lists now in my book are going to be 41% and offer will be 39. Hmm. And the reason why I say that is that I think that list is so critical is that without a starving crowd, you know, it's like, I think Gary Halbert uses the example. It's like, if I'm going to sell hamburgers, why do I want to sell hamburgers to people who just had a, a full meal? Right. And so that's the obvious thing. But, and it's the old story. You know, if I send the best sales letter I could do, the best creative, the best offer, and I send it to the wrong audience for yeah. that, I'm going to get zero response. Yeah. But the opposite, mediocre creative with an offer that's just so-so, but to an audience that's starving for that information, yeah. you're going to make some money. Yeah. Now, you'll do better with an irresistible offer and killer copy, right? Yeah. So I think Albert, you know, for a, co a copywriter that understood audience and list, and we'll talk about Gene Schwartz in a minute because he put that on steroids. But the 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 idea of that, I think, was the forerunner of all the best copywriters yeah. today and, and after Gary Halbert. Yeah. That they really, to understand writing great copy, you yeah. got to understand your audience. I always say that I would never hire a copywriter at Boardroom who didn't ask me for a list history of the audience that responded to the offer the list that didn't work for that offer and yeah. that product, the approaches that the, if, if, if uh, I'll go a step further, They'll, they would come to me, the, the copywriters I fell in love with, they would say to me, such and such lists work for this product. I'm going to, so they're coming to me, they're writing for a product for me. 
such and such list work. Can you get me the mailing piece, the promotion that got the names on that list? So I could see the approach that was used yeah. to get the names on a list. That's a list that's going to work for the product that I'm writing that's for. Interesting. How? Yeah. So how incredibly smart is that? But so logical, right? And I think Gary understood that at a deep level. The other thing um, that you know, Gary Halbert, that that uh, Joe Polish and I always quote, and 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 Joe is a you know, Gary he, he credits Gary Halbert for you know getting him out of the gutter, out of and into business, um, learning direct response from Gary Halbert, and it was every business problem can be solved with a great sales letter. Yeah. So. You know, while he was a slave to the starving crowd and making sure that the list was right, he also yeah. knew that if all the other things were in place, the power of a sales letter could get you out of a lot of messes. And I saw it at Boardroom. You know, the biggest breakthroughs we ever had at Boardroom um, were not little tweaks and they were not – sometimes you change the price and little stuff in the offer. That would make some big changes. Yeah. But the biggest lifts in response we would ever get – would be if we went out to a new copywriter with a new sales approach and a new letter and a new package, a new thing altogether, and that was the way that we would have the opportunity to lift response by the largest margin, or we'd have the worst failures, but we're taking the swing for the home run, and the only way to hit home runs is to get you know, the brand new package and the sales letter. So that was a, a big thing about, about Halbert. Um, and again, that whole thing, I mean, the disciples and apprentices that he had, you know, has made the direct marketing world better, a better place today than it ever could have been. Yeah. And Brian, I mean, at some, at one point you were considered one of the greatest list managers, right? So you lived this. Can you walk me through one of those campaigns? Like you said, a copywriter said, how did they get on the list? And then can you walk me through one an example of that? Like Yeah, so I did a I did an article once. Um, it was called Data Cards Guilty Until Proven Innocent. Okay. And what that meant was for those of people who don't even know what a data card is, um, every list in the industry that people would use in direct mail would have a data card. It would be an in, a, a five by seven card. It would tell you the number of names on the list, where the names were derived, you know, what was everything about the list. Yeah. And they, to me, they were guilty until proven innocent because you had to ask so many questions to make sure that the person that wrote this data card, not that they were lying, some were lying intentionally because they didn't want, they wanted to hide the fact that the names weren't really as good as they, they were saying they were. But you had to know what questions to ask. Yeah, like what? Yeah. So, so the big questions are, I mean, you have to know the source of the names. So if the names were generated through a sweepstakes – versus a 24 page direct mail letter those are very different kinds of subscribers or buyers right, right right and so not to say that one's better than the other if you have a sweepstakes offer you might want to rent the people who came out of sweepstakes right. so there's a there was a an old adage that said if you really want to know the makeup of a list go look at the promotion that got the name right, right. if you want to know the makeup of a list go look at the promotion that got the name and so I would spend an incredible amount of effort since I was selling the boardroom lists in the marketplace that I was representing them. I would show people the mailing pieces we use to get those names. And they would see that the people that would be on our list would be total information junkies, which means if you have a product that is an information product, my list was going to be great for you. Right. And then when I started buying lists for the company, renting lists for the company from outside sources, I would ask those same questions. Show me the mailing piece that got the name. And in addition, sh tell me a lot more about it. Tell me the percentage of these 50,000 names that came in from this mailing piece versus some other mailing piece. Or if it was like a big conglomeration of a list, like all book buyers, for example. Right. Well, do you have different book titles? I'll, I'll give you a horror story. If you don't ask these questions, they won't tell you, right? Yeah. So yeah. what happened was, there was a book publisher that was renting um, health books. And then all of a sudden, their best-selling book was a women's health book. So out of the blue, mm. half of their file became women. But if you rented the last three-month buyers, they were 100% women. Now, what if you were used to renting a list that was a broad scope or you were used to renting the list because it was mostly men before? 
Now you didn't ask the question and you didn't do a gender select. Right. And you didn't select men. Now they just give you the new buyers and they were all women. I, mean, I used that as a horror story because that was a horror story. Why? What happened with but, that? Well, you got really low response rate because yeah. you had a male, M-A-L-E oriented offer and you took a cross section of the list and it was 80% women. Yeah. So that was a horror story and an obvious one. And the list manager should have told you what was on that list, but because you didn't ask the question. So that's why always asking how the name got there. And you know what? The same is true in online today. You know, yeah. you don't, you don't, you don't pick an affiliate until you understand what they bought, how they bought, what was the approach, what was the price point, all of those things. So you're still asking the same questions about the list that you use. Um, you know, e cold email doesn't work that well, so it's not as appropriate to, but if you use, if you ever were going to try a cold email list, God, you'd have to ask even way more questions than we used to ask as it pertained to direct mail. So that was a tangent on lists, but it was, you know, it's just such an important thing. And these copywriters, people like Gary Halbert and Gene Schwartz, they understood that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I'm so tempted to dig into some of the success stories. But um, I want to cover Eugene Schwartz also. Um, so what sticks out with Eugene Schwartz? What should people know about him and, and learn from him? So a bunch of things. I mean, breakthrough advertising will be the insurance that Gene Schwartz lives forever, obviously. It's, uh, and it's a book that I am trying to get the rights to for the next 15 years. I've had it for the last number of years. Um, Is that hard and, to, to get? No, no, no. I'm working with Gene's wife. Hmm. I mean, it won't be hard to get. I just want to get it in writing before I go to reprint. Right. Um, I'm using up inventory at the moment and I am selling them, but um, it really is the most important book I've written on copy, creative, human behavior. Um, it's the book that the, some of the best copywriters today use to teach their copy cubs really how to how to look at all your different audiences, that yeah. your list is not one list. And it's not a book about lists. And yet, because Gene was such a student of audiences, and because he was a voracious reader and always understood that knowing who you're writing to and what's happening in the world is so important for a copywriter and for someone marketing products and services that he was just such a student of all of that. So breakthrough advertising is, is super important. But another thing, you know, just to give you an indication, like Gary Halbert, of why he was able to connect this messaging and copy with lists and list selection I wrote a blog post uh, not that long ago. I reprinted it, which was, it's not always about the money. And um, I think I reprinted it as Gene Schwartz is my homeboy. Um, because there's actually a mug that you can buy on Cafe Press. Yes. And on the mug, it, there's a picture of Gene Schwartz. It says, Gene Schwartz is my homeboy. And on the other side, it says, David Ogilvy has my back. So it's like my favorite mug. I drink coffee out of it whenever it's clean. And so... So Gene Schwartz is my homeboy, and I told the story about how Gene used to write copy for us at Boardroom, and it was just incredible copy. And, you know, he could have charged us twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 per package that he wrote for us, per sales letter. And instead, what he did was, since he had a little publishing company of his own called Instant Improvement, and his little publishing company had these little books, but he needed to mail other people's lists because he didn't have a big list. Two of the biggest health book buyer lists on the market were Boardroom and Rodale, mm -hmm. two big companies. And so Gene Schwartz wrote some of the best packages that Boardroom ever mailed, some of the best packages that Rodale ever mailed for Rodale books and Boardroom books. And instead of us paying him cash, we paid him in names. Wow. So Gene would. He's would, that confident. He was. Well, and not only that, think about this. So he could, let's say he could have gotten $30,000 for a package, okay? Yeah. If he gets 750,000 names from from me, at, now I would I would give him 750,000 names in exchange for a package. So let me do the math. So I'll, I'll try to do this quickly. 750,000 names, and then he mails those names, and maybe he gets a 2% response. So then he gets 15,000 buyers to his book, and his book is probably $30. So now he just made, what, $450,000. Wow on sales and he's cross-selling to his list 
other did I get that math right? I think I did. I mean, I gave you a best case scenario. Yeah. But two percent. Seven hundred fifty thousand, right? He gets a point oh two. Um that means he gets fifteen thousand book buyers. Maybe he sold them for twenty dollars a piece. So that's three hundred thousand dollars. Still a good payday. Still <laughs> ten times the payday that he would have gotten for writing the package. But it was even bigger than that because he knew the lifetime value of those right. names. He could resell to those names. He was going to sell other books to them. Right. So and not only that, could he then rent his list to other health people? Of right. course. Yeah. So talk about forward thinking that he was like a marketer, a copywriter. How did that conversation occur? Did he present that or did yes. Boardroom? What, did he go in knowing he wanted to do that? or yeah, Yes. He yeah. Knew. Oh, yeah. And he knew. So here was another thing. You know, I did another blog post fairly recently called Your Mentors Choose You. And the concept there was that, you know, I didn't go to Dick Benson or Gene Schwartz and say, hello, will you please be my mentor? You know, yes, we were working with them. Gene was a copywriter for us and, 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 and Dick Benson was a direct mail consultant. But what I did was when I found out in the case of Gene that he needed help with list selection, not only on the, like I was helping him get the best selects for that 750,000, right. right? I was getting him the best names. And then he saw that I knew what I was doing as far as lists. And then I said, you know, Gene, I looked at the list you're mailing other than Boardroom and Rodale, and I don't think you're getting good recommendations. So then I went, I wasn't a list broker, but I went and shared with him everything I knew about the health book and health newsletter and health list marketplace. I gave him all these list recommendations. I didn't get a brokerage commission. I told him which list to mail. He mailed them. He did really well. And I didn't ask him for anything in return. It was just because right. I love Gene Schwartz, right? right? And so what do you think happened? He started inviting me to his house for lunch. Sure, he wanted some list ideas, <laughs> but I got the right. better end of that deal because I got to sit at Gene's feet. Well, we sat at the same table and we ate lunch together. And he just was like, you know, brilliance you know taught me so much like all these things about what's you know, some of the best advice you got personally from gene from gene yeah <laughs> one of them was reading the national Enquirer. that's great advice it is and marty edelston followed it and and you know it's not that that you want to get all your news from there just like you don't want to get all your news from cnn or msnbc or fox <laughs> news yeah, either, right. right um but <laughs> you're in trouble you want to get, to get all a your news. sense of what humans are up to yeah. And understanding human beings at that deepest level. So that was a great piece of advice. The other one is the story that we talk about in the uh, in the book and also it's in the video where his egg timer thing where, you know, 33 minutes, 33 seconds, you know, he would always sit for thir and set the egg timer and then he'd get up and then because he, he said there was no such thing as writer's block. And he talks about that in the video that we are giving away. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, the biggest advice, too, is a very simple piece of advice is, you know, I, I and Marty didn't read a lot of fiction. I didn't read a lot. I read all, almost all fiction in college because I was an English major. But when I graduated college, I, I stopped reading fiction. I, it was all nonfiction. Yeah. And I think he convinced me that, you know, there's room for fiction. And now all the copywriters I hang around with today. They say you're crazy if you don't read fiction, if you really want to yeah. understand humans. But so it's a mix. So I think he got me out of that. Um, mm. I also think he, he another piece of advice, if you read Gene Schwartz's obituary, um, it almost all talks about his art collecting. Mm. He was one of the greatest art collectors of modern art in the New York, you know, area and, and, his, and, Aaron, and his wife, Barbara, still is. And, you know, there was like a paragraph about him as a direct marketer and copywriter. And so that was a great lesson in itself, isn't it? You know, that it didn't matter that he got accolades for it. He His passion was art. Mm. His passion was also direct marketing and copywriting. Yeah. But he could express his passion in both areas. And one is the one that's noticed by the outside world and the other isn't. And who cares? When you think of... Uh, Gene Schwartz, what story comes to mind? What's a memorable story that you have personally? It's probably the the the, ex the one that popped into my head was the exchanging names for for copy. Um, you know, I think 
a couple. I, I, I shared a bunch of them. Um, you know, some of his copy, the imagination in his copy, you know, how to rub your stomach away, which is one of the ads that we have in the swipe file. Yeah. That we're giving yeah to talk about some of the swipe, uh, some of the campaints. That are yeah. I mean, how to rub short. your stomach yeah. away. The Tao of sexology. Um, just I, I, I don't have them off the top of my head. The headlines were amazing. I mean, we have the original promotion for boardroom reports in that swipe file. Which was read three hundred business magazines. And I have it right minutes, here. Get the guts of each. Yeah. Um, you have it right there, right? Well, this is the I think the first page of the letter, right? That's it, right? Yeah. That launched the entire company. I mean, Gene really? Schwartz, this launched yeah, the whole entire company. Pretty much. Wow. Marty and Gene were really close friends, and so talk about in. this campaign a little bit from the the beginning, and then what happened after it. It actually launched. Well, Portable Reports was, uh, you know, Marty didn't have a lot of money, so he wanted to do a business magazine. So he yeah. decided to do this newsletter with no advertising because it was cheaper. And so, you know, Boardman Reports, you know, he could only mail what he could afford in postage and printing. Yeah. So it was a struggle. I mean, those are, I wasn't there. This was like 1972 to I got there in 81. But, you know, it was, he got it up to about 160,000 subscribers, which was incredible wow. for that time. And it, was mostly on the on the the strength of that letter. Read three hundred business magazines in thirty minutes. That was it. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. wow. That's pretty amazing. Um, anything? I want else? to make sure that people know how to get you know all that stuff. Um, yeah. So they purchase. They can purchase the book. Um, the advertising solution, the thelegendsbook.com. Can they get it on Amazon also? So, so here's or? The well, yeah. So here's the best way to order the book and getting all the bonuses. If they go to thelegendsbook.com, T-H-E-L-E-G-E-N-D-S-B-O-O-K.com, thelegendsbook.com, they go to that page. There's a button you know, for them to buy the book on whatever they prefer, whatever platform they want, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, other. Um, then they go out, they buy the book. Um, it takes them right to the, to the link to the buy the book. Then they come back. They don't. It opens up a new window. They come back, and then they punch in. There's an email right there uh, that they can click on, and basically, once we have that, we do the rest. We basically, you know, give them a page where we give them all the bonuses. So it's a, it's like a hundred and forty page swipe file of, of all of the best ads and letters from those six legends that we talked about. Mm. It's a page where they can access videos, really rare videos of of um, Gary Halbert, Gene Schwartz, and David Ogilvy, and then uh, the scientific advertising annotated and illustrated version PDF. They can download that. All of that's on the page, um, and then Craig put together five other like bonus special reports on some specific things that were not in the book that were other really great lessons so it's like this whole resource page that's just incredibly good so that's the best way to buy the book the legendsbook.com um the books i don't know i think the pre-order was like 17 bucks a book so it's i mean maybe it'll be 21 i don't know it's not an expensive book right uh we're not making money on, i'm not making money on the book um basically what i really want is people to get all of these bonuses and the book so the book becomes a reference tool yeah. all of the additional material becomes an incredible reference tool for them. Yeah. And then, you know, they also will get onto my list. They'll get, to, they'll get to read my blogs. They'll, they'll get tips that I'll be giving, telling stories like I've told today. And Craig does tips as well um, from these legends. Yeah. So you get all of that yeah. by signing up. Yeah. So people, ch I have one last question, Brian. I could talk to you about this for hours. Um, but people should check out thelegendsbook.com and I mean, some of this is just golden and even one of those sample ads is like something that's sold millions and millions of dollars. And so why not look at something that actually call it the hundred has, million dollars right, has worked? Yeah. yeah hundred million. Yeah. It's hundreds of millions. And the interesting thing is that you can steal smart. Like when I give out swipe files at my events, it's not for people to just rip off the copy, right. but you can adapt so much, you know. The, the other one, Max Sackheim, the classic ad, which was, uh, do you make these mistakes in English? It was for a language program mm -hmm. written in 1920-something. Yeah. I just saw an ad, uh, an email, not that, not that long ago, 
that was from an internet marketer, and it said, do you make these mistakes in internet marketing? And it was like one of his best openings. Mm -hmm. What should people make sure not to miss when they're reading the book? Good question. Um, I think that um, I think if you're going to skim, you're not you're not a heavy reader. Look for the everywhere there's boldface listings, like the 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 components of a good headline. The and and they're in every chapter. There's like, you know, there's not a summary thing in every chapter. That's a list. But wherever there are lists of bullet points and numbered items, I specifically made sure to make those checklists, things to, that every headline should have, things every sales letter should have. Right. You know, we didn't do a lot of things. We didn't do anything on lists because, you know, that wasn't the purpose of the book. I'll do that in my book, you know, things to. But but also like what um, how to um, make sure, you know, how to survey and, and, and scout the competition. Things you should do, like best practices in seeing who's out in the marketplace so that mm. you can make sure that you're presenting your product uniquely. Yeah. So there's a lot of different lists in the book. And that's why I, you know, when Perry said to me, you know, have the book next to you on your desk, I, I, I thought to myself, yeah, that's like a good use of the book if you're not going to read it cover to cover right away. Yeah. I, I have about 50 more questions. I'm going to stop it there before I get out of control, Brian. So people should ch check out the legendsbook.com uh, with the, some of the legends and then some of the color from, from Brian Kurtz and Craig Simpson. Um, so I really appreciate taking the time for distilling all these greats into one complete uh, guidebook for us. Thank you. And, so, uh, you know, having been on your show before, I know that you don't take repeats lightly and so either, three you know, I, I did a good job the first two times or, as, as I said before we got on, the third time's a charm. Like, you know, Brian, you couldn't get it right the first time. You couldn't get it right the second time. So at least since you're giving away all this good stuff, maybe I'll let you on a third time. The fifth time's a charm. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Brian. I appreciate it. Thanks, Jaron. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.